Um, so my name is Philip Hackstock. I work here uh, at IASA as a research software engineer, um, and I will uh, give you a presentation about PyM. We will start with a quick overview of what PyM is, why you would want to have it, um, what kind of features we have, and then I will do uh, an interactive kind of session where I will give you a little bit of a feature showcase so that you can see uh, the types of things that you can expect to do with PyM. So to start, um, what are the session goals? So there are a couple of questions that after this presentation, you should be able to answer for yourself. The first one is why would you want to use PyM? Um, uh, the second one is that, of course, this is a very important one. We had it uh, in the previous session, data formats. Uh, what kind of data formats are supported for reading and writing? Um, plotting is very important. You have a uh, beautiful, Data, you have beautiful results. You need to you need to present them. IAM has a lot of options for you here. Um, and then, of course, to go more sort of in the analysis side of things, um, Python um, and PyM with that supports time series arithmetic, so you can do addition, subtraction, um, and that kind of stuff. But maybe before um, before you go into the features the kind of why, why do we need PyM? Why is it a useful tool? And it's kind of it's kind of a bridge or sort of a healthy middle ground between tools that are like more on the diagnostic side of modeling, but that are hardwired to a specific modeling framework. Um, and on the other side, you have tools that are just general purpose, like uh, NumPy or Pandas, if you live in Python, uh, Tidyverse, if you live in R. And there was kind of a missing middle ground of a, of a package that was sort of generic enough that you could do stuff that is model independent, but specific enough so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to run a little analysis script. And so that's where PyM kind of fits in. Uh, so PyM uses existing infrastructure. So it uses, if you, uh, if you work in Python, I'm sure you've heard of pandas or numpy. Um, but then it is specific for the use case of integrated assessment models. Um, then sort of to motivate it a little bit more, um, the, the aim of, of uh, PyM is to improve uh, scripts for, scena for scenario analysis and data visualization. And the point is that here, a lot of teams already adopt very good practices for their model development. So a lot of models are tested, a lot of models are well-documented. Um, the same sometimes cannot be said about the analysis scripts. So imagine you have some data, you just quickly want to want to have a plot. So you add a few lines, you have the first graph, great. Uh, you add a few more lines. Okay, now you change the axis, uh, you flip it, you add another one, um, and it gets, it gets messy and it gets quickly um, out of hand. And so again, this is where PyM comes in as kind of a toolkit that is developed to the best standards of open science practices. It is uh, tested, it is documented, and it kind of abstracts a lot of these um, cumbersome tasks that you would need to do every time it abstracts those out. Um, it is an open source project. So we have a users forum, we have like a, a Q and A site where, where people can interact and uh, can also contribute. So the good thing is that um, this also uh, leads to better reproducibility of the results because you're all of a sudden, your analysis scripts from being super long, um, super involved, they're very short, leads to fewer errors um, and overall better science. The vision for this um, PIAM is um, as a community toolbox for energy climate research. Um, the first sort of thing is that built on a harmonized data format that I will present in a minute, the IEMC data format that is. Um, it is model independent. Um, as I said before, it's not a tool that is kind of hardwired to a specific modeling framework. So although it's developed mainly uh, here at IASA and we have the message model, it is not specific to the message model. Um, but then it is specific enough to the domain of integrated assessment modeling um, so that you can quickly use it with, uh, with your model outputs. It has a modular package architecture. So if there are things in terms of analyzing data or plotting data that go sort of beyond 
what uh, PyM can do for you. It interfaces really nicely with things in uh, in Python like pandas um, for plotting if you use matplotlib. So kind of the, the standard tools, um, which is where also like the, the open source and the collaborative aspect comes in. If you have a really cool feature that you kind of develop, um, we would really appreciate, you know, uh, bringing it back to the community, opening opening a pull request and then bringing, bringing the features, the cool features that you build so that everybody um, benefits from it. Um, we also have, uh, this is, um, one of our uh, summer students did this. Uh, we have a high performance implementation. Uh, we're using Panda series over, uh, over the standard data frame, which would really lends itself to the way that the data is structured and makes it makes it a lot faster. Um, and we have, I think, north of 90% or north of 95% test coverage. So you can be you can be quite sure that the results that um, PyM is giving you, at least in the in the calculations in there, um, they're sound. Now uh, on the on the package itself, um, starting with the data format, just so that uh, it's a bit easier to imagine what what we're talking about. This is the the IEMC standard, um, which is defined to have these kind of five um, index columns, if you will. There's a model, a scenario, a region, a variable, and a unit column. And then in this, uh, this is the wide format. Um, now you have for each year. Uh, <clears throat> You have a value. The people, um, the ones amongst you who are more involved in energy systems modeling and not so much in integrated assessment modeling might find it useful that we also have support for subannual time resolution for continuous time formats. So for whatever, 12 o'clock, um, one o'clock or something like that. And then also categorical representations of a winter night or a summer day or a these kinds of these kind of things. Um, the standard way that we load these data into PyM uh, is using Excel, um, but we also support CSV files and the frictionless data package format. There was a um, uh, PyM kind of supports three core um, pillars or three core uh, use cases. The one is is data processing, so this is reading your data, uh, converting it, aggregating it. Uh, downscaling it, and it also has a utility for unit conversion. If you've ever had to deal with physical units, you know that it can be kind of painful. Um, so we have a package called IAM Units, which does a lot of that, uh, a lot of that for you. So if you have energy data that is in megaton of oil equivalent, it is a, a single or a half a line of code to convert it to exajoule or something like that. So. So there, uh, this way you can you can quickly and easily um, unit-wise standardize your data sets. Uh, you can also perform validation. So you can check for the completeness of data. You can check for consistency. Um, and finally, analysis and visualization. There is the um, before mentioned arithmetic that you can do with the time series. Um, and then also some plotting that I will show later. The, since it is an open source package, uh, it's very important to us that we develop a community around it. Um, the first thing that for us is very important is that it's easy to install. Um, as it is a Python package, it is hosted on uh, the repositories PyPy and Conda. So whether you're uh, using pip install or you're using Conda install, you can you can use both of them and get the uh, get the latest releases of the um of the package the we have a, a full documentation which a lot of people put a lot of work into it it is full of uh, tutorials and getting started um and and uh and nicely nicely done examples um we also have a slack channel that you can that you can join so if you have any questions um find any bugs have any feature requests uh this is this is a good place to start and then for the expert user who wishes to uh, collaborate, which we of course always uh, very much welcome, uh, there's a GitHub repository. So the code is hosted uh, openly on GitHub. And um, yeah, if you have an idea for a cool feature, we always appreciate uh, contributions. Now, um, coming to the live demo section, um, there is a GitHub repository. This is a, an open one. so. 
you can um, afterwards you can you can take a look at it. You can take a look um, kind of while I'm while I'm talking about it. Um, something that I forgot to mention initially is that these um, these slides are also uh, available on Zenodo. There is the the DOI here, but I'm sure that we will also share it at some point um, on the on the overview page for this uh, for this workshop. So I will increase the size a little bit, a little bit more, maybe once more. So I think now people in the back row, you can read it. I hear, I, I see a nod. Very good. Um, yeah, so this is uh, credit where credit is due. This is based on the work by uh, by Daniel, Daniel Hoopman, who I'm sure uh, most of you know. Um, this was initially developed for uh, the modeling lab um, and is now adapted for, for this workshop. Um, as I said before, the easy way to install PyM is either as using pip, you can uh, alternatively also use Conda. Um, if you want the bleeding edge, the latest and greatest version of it, you can also install it directly um, from GitHub. You can also consult uh, the documentation here um, where we have all the details about how to install it, Conda, PyPy, uh, and from source as well. In any case, maybe I should uh, showcase first the documentation a little bit. So uh, on the left side here, you see information about the data model. So if you want to read up on how exactly the IMC standard is defined, this would be a good place to start. Um, then we have the tutorials here where we have a really nice first steps uh, introduction where it kind of walks you through how to read in a data set and then how to go about it but it also goes into more advanced use cases, such as reading data directly from a scenario explorer. Coming back to the tutorial notebook, um, let's run this. So first off, we uh, simply import PyM. Uh, the way you read this in, if you have Excel or CSV, then you can directly uh, instantiate the data frame using uh, using the string or a path here to your data file. If you have a frictionless uh, data package, there is a there is a section here in the documentation that details how you would go about um, reading in frictionless data. So I'm trying to bring home the point when in doubt uh, the docs are the docs are pretty good and they're sort of your your first, uh, first line of defense for finding things. So now we read this in. Um, by the way, the people, those of you that are, uh, who are familiar with pandas, a lot of these operations that I will show here are gonna be very familiar with you. This is, um, this is intentional. A lot of the design principles follow closely the syntax and the kind of API that, that pandas provides. Uh, and under the hood, it is a uh, panda series. So now if we read in um, the data, we can insert another cell and kind of get an idea of what we, of what we actually read in here. So the data set is a very short um, data set. The data set is provided with the GitHub repository that is linked in the, uh, in the presentation. It is from the NGFS phase two. The NGFS is the network for the greening of the financial system. Um, and it is a short excerpt uh, of what uh, what we have produced here. We have two models. We have message IX Globium and we have Remind Magpie. We have four different scenarios, uh, six different regions and a bunch of variables. Now you will see here that some of these details are kind of omitted. This is just to make it easier to have an overview and print it. But of course, um, you can get the complete insights into what is available. Um, thank you. Um, if you just, uh, if you type the corresponding dimension, so we can take a look at the variable. 
Uh, we can take a look at all of the models that we have, which models is not very not very spectacular, but yeah, you can you can basically kind of explore um, your your data set here. Um, one of the things that we will that we will do in this uh, in this presentation just to make it easier is we will filter it for just the world region. So we will do dot filter. We will give it the dimension that we want to filter in. And then we want to filter um, by the world region. We can verify that actually this has worked by again printing the data frame. And then we now see that we only have a single uh, single region here remaining. So we have we've eliminated all of the other ones. Um, yeah, let's start by let's start by visualizing uh, what we what we actually have. Um, so we we see here we have a bunch of variables. Temperature is usually a good one uh, to illustrate. So we can start by plotting this. Um, this doesn't look very nice yet. So this uh, directly interfaces with the matplotlib um, API. So if you have uh, if you have worked with matplotlib, this will be this will be very familiar with you. So I can set the the legend um, parameter as it's this one. And now this looks a lot better. What we see here, uh, it's a little bit of a mess because it basically just took the colors in order. Um, and it doesn't, it's not really easy to read. There are four different models and there are, uh, there are two different models and four different scenarios, so a total of eight combinations. So what we would actually like to do is we would like to uh, color this. So this we can do by using the color option here. What we want to do is we want to color it by the scenario so that we can basically get two different colors, one for each scenario. We again want to have the, the legend um, here. So now this looks a lot better, um, but of course now we have lost the model information. So now we can retrieve that basically by using, first we've used color, now we're going to use line style um, by doing this. And now this looks a lot better. So we can see that all the message models are the, the solid line. Uh, all of the remind models are the dashed line, and then basically the colors represent the scenarios. So this is what I what I meant initially is that within basically a single line of code, you can have it's not of course not quite production ready um, for a publication, but you can get a you can get a very quick feel um, for what for what you have and for how different models um, encode the different scenarios, and so. Um, this is also a nice kind of cross check so that we can see that, of course, the blue lines are close ish together, as are the green, as are the other colored lines. So this is kind of a this is kind of a good sanity check that although they are different, each model kind of based on the same scenario assumptions uh, gets a roughly similar set of results. Um, as alluded to before, we um, we have a unit conversion uh, functionality. Uh, before I get to that, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the the actual uh, time series data as it is encoded in in the data frame. So this is basically what it looks like. This is very close to the data format that I showed before. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to there's here um, the coal indicator, the coal time series. So we want to uh, filter that out, and we want to have it only for a single model, we want to have it only for a single scenario, and we want to have it only for the call variable. This is how you, oops, this is how you use um, filter function. So if we now run this, we can see that we have just a single, um, single time series for 2010 to 2100. Um, we now, for example, let's say we don't like exajoule, Per year, we can do convert unit, and we can convert it from our input, which is exajoule per year. We can do 
petawatt hours per year. This, uh, this seems to have worked because we have a different unit here now. Um, and if we again call the time series function, then we can see that there is a factor of a factor of roughly one fourth, which is the correct the correct conversion. Um, in the background, there is the IAM units package. So you can basically look up there what kind of uh, variables and what kind of variable conversions are supported. Um, again, you see a you see a theme here. Um, there's of course a tutorial about it. So there are in this um, in this notebook there are a bunch of these uh, these links here. So you can follow them and then basically on your own go through these tutorials where these concepts are explained a little bit more in detail. Another thing that we can do uh, is we can compute aggregates. So if we look at the um, at the variables, we can see that we have primary energy, and this is kind of the, the IMC style um, way of uh, categorizing variables. So you have a, a category, then you have the pipe uh, separator, and then you have sort of the sub uh, category here. And what we see, this is of course intentional, is that the primary energy, the entire indicator is missing, right? We have the biomass, coal, gas, and so on. We have all of these subcategories, but we don't have um, the, the primary energy variable. We can do this by simply calling the aggregate function. And then as we see, we have a single variable. So PyM kind of speaks, understands this template, this format where a pipe basically uh, indicates hierarchy. So if I just tell it aggregate primary energy, it understands that it needs to take all of these indicators. Um, it needs to basically separate them by pipe and it needs to then add them up. Um, and of course also visualize that. So here we would now have the primary energy demands for the different scenarios. And again, kind of as a little cross check, we can see that the current policy scenario for at least for message is the one with by far the highest energy demand, which again, intuitively kind of makes sense. There is another um, option. So we can also show this in a time series format. Um, this basically returns you the wide pandas data frame. So if you have any kind of further analysis that goes beyond what uh, what PyM has to offer, at this point you're dealing with the with the pandas data frame. So there you can you can continue. Um, alternatively to the time series, which is the wide format, you can also have the data in a long format, which is the dot data attribute. So here you would then have it as um, again these kind of five. Um, these five uh, index columns uh, plus the year and then the value for each year. Um, what we've done before or what we've seen here is that if you if you have just this this aggregate by default, it will only return the newly created aggregate. Um, sometimes what we of course want to do is we want to take in a data set, we want to compute additional aggregates and we kind of want to enrich it and sort of have a pipeline um, style structure, which again, if you know pandas will be kind of familiar to you. Uh, we're gonna simply say append uh, equals true. And then if we take a look here, now all of a sudden we don't only have the, uh, the one primary energy variable, but if we look at the, the variables, um, we can see that we have all of the previous primary energy subcategories and the newly aggregated uh, primary energy. Yes. Do I get an error in the primary energy? Yeah. Very good question. Let's see. I don't think you get an error. I think it kind of recognizes that it's already there and it uh, keeps it, but. 
Let's try that out. Yeah, so it just it just keeps it. Um, of course, now we would need to um, we would need to check actually what the values are. But yeah, if I rerun it, uh, the value doesn't change, so it's smart enough to know that okay, it's there, and then um, yeah, it does it. And also, if you would have, uh, of course, there can be uh, further subcategories. So let's run this again. So we have the Ah, okay. Uh -huh. Now we want to append it, and now it uh, now it complains. Um, but if we if we take a look, do we have here. Ah, oh, yes, we have we have the complete um, complete data frame. Now I lost my. Mm -hmm. um, ah, yes. If you have, that was the point I wanted to make. If you have further uh, levels in the hierarchy because of course you could have um, you could have maybe not coal but you would have primary energy pipe fossil pipe coal pipe gas pipe oil um, then it is also smart enough to kind of know and avoid like double counting so basically if you have if you have a, a hierarchy and then one hierarchy has like a further one then it would it would take these values and, and and smartly compute them without without double counting. Um, yes, so that was of course only the variable dimension. You can also of course aggregate along the region dimension. So this is particularly important if you have a model comparison study where your models might have different spatial resolution. Right, one model might be reporting. Uh, Europe, the other model might be reporting Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Northern Europe. Um, and this is also covered by PIAM. So in this case, you wouldn't aggregate, for example, primary energy in all these subcategories, but you would aggregate only a single variable, but then across different regions. Um, it also supports uh, weighted aggregation because not all the time you want to simply add everything up. So in the case of energy demand, it of course makes sense to add this up, but as soon as you get into things like uh, carbon price or something like that, it doesn't really make sense to add this up, but you would probably want to compute like a weighted average or something like this. So you would weight the average then by, and this is where the discussions start, um, for example, energy demand. Um, see that we have we have a good amount of time still so i might just i might just continue um the next kind of uh broad topic that i have is meta indicators where um where we can take a look at our our data frame um yes Sorry, Philip, for the delayed question. It's, it's on this aggregation yes. uh, uh, topic again. So you said that it's quite clever to avoid double counting. But um, what happens if you miss a level? So I've got fossil, coal, brown coal, fossil, coal, lignite, and I try and aggregate at the primary energy level. Would it catch sort of two levels down as well? and it if, should, I, yes. if I haven't computed the intermediate um, uh, value, it should in principle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is something to be tried out. It's a very good yeah, question. I, um, yeah. I, 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 yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, but it should in principle. Um, in principle, it should be there. Um, so now uh, what we can do is we can use uh, meta indicators because sometimes you want to uh, categorize your scenarios. So what we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, filter our data frame again, and we want to have uh, only the variable um, temperature, just to verify that this has this has worked. We now only have the temperature. Um, we can take a look at the time series, so at the actual data, and we can we can see that this is the 
uh, degree of global warming relative to the pre-industrial times. And you can see that some of the scenarios, especially current policies and delayed transition, reach uh, above two degrees before the end of the century. Delayed transition actually doesn't. Um, but we want to, let's say we want to categorize this. So the way that we would do this is we would we would set um, meta indicator, um, which I will show you in a minute how that is kind of then uh, encoded in uh, in the Excel sheet. We want to set a default value. So let's say that the default value is above two degrees. Um, we then need to give the meta indicator a name, which that would be warming category. And then just to illustrate, we would write this to an Excel file. Um, Now I'm going opening the data here. We can see that uh, this is our data frame. So as expected, we have the oh, it's better. Um, we have the indicators for the temperature for the world region for all eight um, scenario and model combinations, and then here in the meta sheet we have created a new category uh, called warming category. And we have for now at least set everything to above 2C, which is the, the default we gave it. So of course not very useful right now because we definitely have scenarios that, we luckily have scenarios that, uh, that, that don't reach two degree. So we would need to categorize that. Coming back is we would need to use the aptly named categorize function. Um, so we would do ef dot categorize. We would then say which um, meta indicator we want to apply it. We would then need to specify what kind of uh, what kind of value should be put if uh, the criteria is met. And finally, we need to specify the criteria. So we're looking at the temperature indicator and we want to have the ones that don't reach the upper bound of two degrees. Uh, PIAM is very nice. PIAM tells us that it has found four scenarios that it has categorized as below two degrees. We can now take a look at this meta category and we can see that it has correctly identified that current policies is above two degree, delayed transition is below, net zero is also below, and NDCs is also above. So with this, um, you can of course make um, more involved comparisons um, and categorizations, but this can be really useful to again get a feel of your of your data set and see um, see kind of where where things are, and and, and especially. Uh, this can be a good and easy way to find out uh, differences between models because it could be that for one model maybe a scenario doesn't reach a certain target um, or or something else. Um, again, as before, the IAM documentation is your best friend. So here there's the categorize function and it basically it gives us an overview of what we can do um, with the criteria. So we can do up and low um, for the bounds, and then we can do a year as well. So we could say, we could make this categorization even finer and say, um, we're not looking at the overall uh, temperature range, but we're looking at maybe just the year 2050. So what, what happens in the year 2050? So we could also categorize um, along that. Um, Yes, and so we can now uh, take a look and basically according to the way that we have now categorized that we can use these meta indicators, these categorizations as colorings for a plot. So we 
would take, for example, the primary energy gas. So this can give us an idea of how important um, the models think that gas is depending on the degree of global warming. So we would use the colors attribute. Filter data frame is empty out because I have excluded the temperature attribute, which means that I now need to bring it back. This is, of course, the risk when you do a live demonstration with a Jupyter notebook. Um, I guess I would need to read in this snapshot before, filter out the world data, and then perhaps come back here. <laughs> Sorry? Ah, very true. Thank you. So I would need to, without filtering, I should set them here, categorize. This is how we get audience participation. Um, do I have a typo in here? I don't think so, actually. Um, ah, plural, the attribute is called color, not colors. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now we have, uh, we have categorized uh, above and below uh, to degree. Now, this is not super useful right now, um, as again, we have swallowed up completely the information about uh, the models. So we can bring this back in analogy to before the line style. Uh, we can use the models here. So now all of a sudden we see, okay, we have um, the message again and the, and the solid lines and the dashed lines representing um, Remind. And we can also, there are two more, two more indicators. Again, you find the complete uh, overview in the documentation. We can use the fill between um, attribute to kind of describe the ranges. So this is now within, um, within each uh, warming category. We find there's quite a big range. And this is also kind of uh, kind of what you would what you would want to analyze in a model comparison study is that depending is, is although these models uh, kind of come out to the same to the same warming category, they have drastically different amounts of uh, mm -hmm. primary energy gas in in, in our case. Um, and then for final uh, illustrative, Thing, you can also then have these little bars here in the end to kind of illustrate how how wide the range actually is. Um, since we have quite a few things to go, uh, I would say that we can take maybe a five minute break. Um, that's fine for everyone. Maybe catch a, maybe we can open the windows, catch some fresh air. And then since it's, uh, 16 now, I guess we can start back at uh, 20 past. All right, I see there are a few, uh, few empty spots. Maybe if, you're, if your colleague has fled the scene, you can try and catch them. Uh, otherwise I would say we can continue and then they can come, they can come later. Um, we're onto the topic of algebraic operations. So we're more on the analysis side now, um, PyM supports. Um, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. There is the it's the following syntax. So you give it you give it a, b, and c, which you have a an operator method um, that takes a and b, which is the left and the right side of the operator, and then c is the resulting um, name for c is the name for the result. Um, uh, this is this is a key point. Um, possible PyM will try to keep the unit consistent. So basically, if you divide 
unit A by unit B, and they're the same, then they will be unitless. Uh, this is again very handy because this is an easy mistake to make if you're if you're dealing with uh, numbers that are not dimensionless. So now, um, as an example, let's try and compute the amount of primary energy that uh, we require in a scenario which is not uh, linked to coal. Which, according to this uh, to this here introduced syntax, we can do the following way: we get the primary energy variable, we want to subtract primary energy, the share of coal, and we want to call the result very creatively primary energy non-coal. Now, somehow it seems it didn't like that too much. Okay. Let's see if I did. Um, ah, yes. That was skipped. How was that? How was that skipped? Let's jump back to the aggregate example. Here you can kind of see, which of course this was on purpose. Um, you can kind of see the beauty of the of the PyM package. So it's a single line to add these kinds of things, which is which is very nice. So now we can again uh, try our operation here. Uh, we want to subtract um, from the primary energy the share of coal, and we then want to call it non-coal. That's a lot better. So now we have a data frame pretty much in the same way as before with the aggregate function. It also returns a data frame with just a single variable. Um, and then to kind of plot it, we can see here, Then we would need the legend um, command where we would have the lock as That's not right. So now we can see that the <clears throat> the scenarios such as net zero. Um, NDCs um, and current policies. So basically, all of the all of the message scenarios they have a very high share of non-coal, uh, and all of the remind scenarios seem to seem to favor coal. Continuing here, uh, we of course cannot only um, subtract; we can also divide. So now let's calculate the, um, the share. So the share of primary energy coal versus the complete amount of primary energy. We again very creatively call this share of coal. We want to plot this. And again, if we want to actually be able to read it, we need to set the legend attribute here. So we can see that there are quite a number of scenarios that basically start rapidly phasing out coal around the year between 2020 and 2040. And the only ones that have significant shares of coal still are the two current policy scenarios. So this is kind of a good, this is kind of a good sanity check. Um, so it seems that this is consistent with what we would sort of assume with a uh, low emission scenarios. Um, now, of course, we have done this before 
um, on the variable axis, where we have done one variable and then another variable, and then we have can and then we have computed the share. And in the same way as before, where we had the aggregation option along the variable axis, as well as the region axis, we can also do these ratios along uh, along different uh, axes. In this case here, we want to do it on the scenario axis. So we first want to filter our data frame so that we're only working with primary energy from Remind. We can see and quickly verify, okay, we have seven variables remaining, all of the primary energy ones. And we now want to divide the, uh, the net zero scenario by the current policy scenario so that we have kind of a, that we get kind of a ratio. And so here we can see this is, these are the ratios um, for the different scenarios and for the, so you can see that the, that the net zero scenario has a high share of biomass, whereas the net zero scenario at the same time has a very low share of coal. So again, this is this is kind of what we would intuitively expect. We were phasing out coal um, in favor of biomass, non-biomass renewables. Um, and then interestingly, oil kind of makes a comeback towards the end of the century. Well, this is just to illustrate that, again, you can not only compare two variables, but you can also compare two scenarios. Um, you could, of course, also do this across different models. So a very general question. Yes. How easy is it to change the y-axis? We have this uh, we have this here where you can basically um, you, it interfaces with um, with matplotlib okay. and so then you can grab uh, you can grab the figure object and then with the figure object you can change the axis uh, which nicely brings me to my next point. Um, so let's import let's import matplotlib, um, and this is this is less of something to <laughs> to digest now, um, but just more of a little bit of a of a feature mm -hmm. showcase that you can with a combination of kind of the the PyM native features, which again interface uh, with matplotlib, um, and using using matplotlib here, where we define different subplots and then we. We plot this, and you can basically here, since this is this all works based on the keyword arguments that get piped through. Um, you can specify which axis this, uh, which which figure this plot is on, um, and then you can do something like this, where here we would have an overview of the fraction of these variables from net zero indices delay transition, all three versus the baseline scenario, which we call current policies. So this is this is again not to not to fully not to fully take the take the example, but just to show that uh, PyM can be used to do quite some quite some more sophisticated analyses and do something that that almost looks like a, a publication uh, publication ready analysis. Now to come to my final point. Um, so far. We have read data only uh, from Excel files. What is, of course, really nice um, is that you can also read data from uh, Yaza web database. So if you've ever worked with um, the SR15 database, special report on the 1.5 degree, or with the AR6 database, uh, you can get the data directly from there. So uh, you open this connection uh, here. You can then, um, you should be able to get a, an overview of the of the different um, the different available databases. I have to admit, and I have to look that up. But the corresponding tutorial is never far. So it's this one here. <coughs> So this shows that there are quite a lot of uh, databases available. The one we want is here. So we want to connect to AR6. 
So we can uh, we can open up the connection. Payam is telling us that this connection was successfully established, and then very similar to before, where we, where we were using dot and then the dimension to get an idea, uh, we can also get here the overview of all of the models. As AR6 was quite a large model comparison study, we have a total of 192 models here. Um, at the same time, we can do an overview of all of the scenarios. So we also have a lot of different scenarios. Um, just to illustrate to you how you would then actually retrieve the data, there's a function called readyasa, where you give it what kind of database you want to read from. Let's say we just want the stuff for the message model. Um, I am here understands the star wildcard, which can be very convenient to like select a family of variables or something like that. Also, the star is of course compatible with using a list, right? So you could do one model and then the wild card. You could do then another model and then the wild card. You can combine this with we could, for example, get here, get all of the emissions. Yes. Is that general regular expression or sorry? Um, is that general regular expression or not? Good question. Off the top of my head, I don't think so. <laughs> Daniel <laughs> gives me the thumbs up from the back. Okay. A general regular expression. Okay. There's a keyword argument saying regex equals false. If you set that to true, you can have regular. Yeah. So you can do all the wild and wonderful stuff that you can do with uh, with regular expressions. Um, and so uh, really nicely down select the, the data that you want. Um, let's not because this is of course quite a large amount of data and this is a live demonstration, let's not push our luck. So we're just gonna go for the message stuff. Um, let's hope that it uh, that it loads in time and then we can just quickly view uh, what we've downloaded. This is perhaps one of the more, one of the more useful or one of the more uh, frequently used features. So again, I've put the, the link to the corresponding uh, PyMDoc uh, tutorial here. It is still loading. Um, so let's see if it will if it will finish in time. But in general, there is the the read the docs page um, here, so you can again, on your own time, uh, look into it and see and see if there's features uh, that interest you. Um, yes, I think it's it's really really interesting. Um, I wonder because it says that you're connected as user Hackstock. Yes. Does that mean you need some kind of uh, special credentials to make that connection to Yasa, or is that open to everyone? Yeah, so for um, for the public ones, which AR6 is a public one, uh, you don't need that, no. Okay. Anybody can, uh, without needing uh, to create a user account. If you are part of a model comparison study and there are internal, um, there are internal instances, then you would have the credentials uh, to log in. But yeah, very good, very good point. Thank you. Um, yeah, so since it's uh, since it's still loading, um, I don't think I would. Uh, I'm gonna wait for it uh, to finish because this is this is most likely gonna take too long. Um, which uh, I hope you trust me that it's a testament to how uh, how big the data chunk is that we're trying to load and not that it's not working. Um, but yeah, just in general, uh, to repeat, there is on. Um, on my GitHub, there is the entire notebook here that you can that you can take a look at. Uh, you can, uh, if you want, it's uh, it's public, so you can create a fork, um, and then you can go through this again at your at your own speed. Um, the data is provided with the notebook so this uh, this runs as is it has two minimal requirements it requires um pym and nomenclature uh pym and matplotlib so once you have installed those two and you have uh you can run a jupyter notebook you can run this and and interact with it uh, at your leisure um now it has actually finished and so if we look at this what we retrieved in the end there were five different models that matched our message IX globium star pattern. Um, 
it then retrieved two variables as we told it to do uh, only for the world region. Um, and it did so for all of these years. Now, again, if we would want to look at it here, we could use the time series function and then we would get the data out in the white format. If you would now want to work with it uh, in an offline way, you could simply use the, the to Excel function and then type in um, your file name and it would export it. Um, I know that I have, I think about an, uh, 50 minutes left, um, but again, if there are no uh, no further questions, I think this was this was already a good amount of <laughs> a good amount of features. Then I would I would close it here, but I saw a, a tentative arm raise. Uh, if we want to integrate this package into, let's say, something that is not necessarily one of the IAM models, uh, mm -hmm. how? Because you you said that it's for uh, following the frictionless data standard. Yeah. How would we uh, specify a different column if I don't know? For instance, the model has like a column for technology type or something. <laughs> Yes, Is that possible? Let, me, let me pull up the documentation for that. Um, in principle, the data model is extensible um, so that you can, where is it here? Ah, yes, custom extra columns of the data table. Uh, so you can add custom, custom extra models, uh, custom extra uh, columns. The downside to that is that they might not be functional in any case other than carrying uh, information right so if you would if you would want to then on top of that do any kind of any kind of logic any kind of arithmetic or or, or something like that um, that you would probably need to probably need to custom code um, we have support for um, for these sub-annual time slices but I think uh, Daniel is better to to elaborate on the on the details uh, there in case anybody is is interested. But yeah, no. In principle, in principle, it is extensible uh, to as many columns as you as you want. But again, functionality you would need to add. Uh, yeah, and just saying that, for example, Will and his team are working on an Osmosis to IMC converter, which uses the the PyM package. So that then you can take any Osmosis style model and convert it into IMC format. Uh, and the same is happening for. Um, the, the the times community is thinking about doing something like that um and uh, now i forget the name the the model developed by joda carolis before he went to eia um hmm? yeah timo has also this kind of converter if you're interested there is a slack channel um take it there or either discuss now over coffee or then continue this discussion how to do this for your model in a slack channel 